The beginning and the end of an article, book, or movie often reveals what the writer feels is important and wants to stress. Psychologists talk to us about primacy and recency. So the first thing and the last thing that we hear has prominence and leaves an impression with us. Well, today is a perfect time to reflect on what John feels is important because we've just heard a passage from the last chapter, chapter 21 of the Gospel of John. Now, going back to the first chapter, you may recall that John says, in the beginning was God. The Word was God, and the Word was made flesh in the person of Jesus. Now, in today's passage, chapter 21, we hear about an encounter between our Lord and the disciples. So clearly, John is focusing at the beginning and the end of his gospel on Jesus. But to understand his important message and the message beyond that, we need to probe today's gospel and unpack it a bit. The scene is the Sea of Tiberias. The disciples have been fishing all night, catch nothing. They come to shore empty-handed, and Jesus is standing there. And they don't recognize him. And our Lord says to them, well, go back out and cast on the right side of the boat, and you will find something. Now, fishermen know that the best time to catch fish is at night, before the sun comes out. Because when the sun starts beating on the water, the fish go deep, and it's much harder to catch them. But Jesus must have been persuasive, because they went back out, and there were so many fish they had trouble pulling in the nets. And it was only at that point, after the miracle, that the beloved disciple recognizes Jesus. So what is John telling us? Well, clearly that God is timeless, and Jesus can perform miracles. But beyond that, John is teaching us that our Lord communicates to us in our everyday lives through others. Because in this case, they did not recognize the Lord, and yet he was communicating to them. And the same thing can happen to us in our everyday lives. When people offer us advice, we should be willing to listen to that advice and accept it. When that advice is grounded in love and truth, God may be at work. Because after all, we know that God is love, and Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. I know in my own life, when I wore a younger man's clothes, I got some advice from my mother that I accepted, and it changed the course of my life. The year is 1973, and I had just graduated from the College of Business Administration at Ohio State. And I'd been accepted to two law schools, Case Western Reserve and Ohio State. And I had figured, well, I had enough of campus life. I can live at home now. So I turned down the invite from OSU and accepted the one at Case. Well, as the summer wore on, I realized, I don't want to stay at home. I want to go back to the campus in Columbus. So in a bit of a panic, I drafted a letter to the Dean of Admissions of the law school at Ohio State. And I said, well, case is very expensive. And I didn't realize that it was going to be a financial crunch for me. And if you don't accept me back, I may not even be able to go to law school. And I showed the letter to my mother. And she says, is this the truth? I said, not really. And she suggested, why don't you write an honest letter? So I threw out that draft, and I wrote a letter to the dean of admissions and said, I realize how much I'm going to miss campus life. I made a mistake. Would you be willing to reaccept me into law school? And about a week later, I got the answer, and it was yes. So that honest letter did the trick. Now, that's not the end of the story. As Paul Harvey says, there's the rest of the story. So when I'm going to law school in Columbus, I get a job 
at the State House in Columbus to help defray expenses. And I get to know State Representative George Mastix from Fairview Park. And he likes the job I do. So when I graduate from law school, he's willing to write me a nice letter of recommendation. So at the time, I send out over 100 resumes. Job market was tight. And I get a response from the prosecutor of the city of Cleveland. She invites me in for an interview, and I'm sitting at the foot of her desk, and I see that letter of recommendation right before her. Well, she makes me an offer, and I accept it. Well, when I start working at the prosecutor's office, I meet a lovely young woman, Lynn Richardson, who's a fellow prosecutor. We become friends, start dating, fall in love, get married. And then on August 9th, 1984, I have the biggest thrill of my life when our daughter is born. And Lynn and I continue to grow in our faith. We put God first, and you may remember that triangle, husband, wife, God, and if you keep going toward God, you grow closer to each other. Well, that was our relationship. And it got to the point where I discerned that maybe I should be a deacon. And Lynn supported me 100% making that possible. So I was ordained in 2010, and fortunate enough to be assigned to this parish, and here I stand before you. Now, I trace all of this back to that letter, that honest letter, because if I hadn't written that letter, I doubt that I would have been accepted, re-accepted at Ohio State. I wouldn't have had that job at the State House. I wouldn't have gotten that letter of recommendation from Representative Mastix. Good chance I wouldn't have been invited to be a prosecutor. Wouldn't have met my wife. And through Lynn, I became a father, had the biggest thrill of my life, and that made my ordination possible. So God was at work all along. It's amazing. Now, my story is not unique. Parents are prime examples of people who love others, love their children in particular, and they invariably do their best to give good, solid, truthful advice to their kids. So. Kids, listen up. When your parents talk to you, remember that they gave you life. They love you. They know you better than anyone else. So when they give you advice, God may be communicating with you through your parents. Now, the adults and parents shouldn't think that we have all the answers because there's no monopoly on the truth. Sometimes young people can teach us things. As an example, there was a tractor-trailer rig that got stuck under a low bridge. And this caused quite a commotion. They had to close down the, the highway. ODOT's called out, police, engineers, everyone's trying to figure out what to do. And one engineer has the idea, well, let's get some industrial jacks and jack up the bridge just a little bit. Bridges have a little flex, and then the tractor-trailer can drive away. Someone else said, no, let's look at the trailer and let's disassemble it from the deck up. And then the trailer can go free. Someone else thought, well, let's get a welder and take off the top of the rig. And then the tractor trailer can go away. Well, along comes a young man and looks at all this and says, why don't you let some air out of the tires? Best idea of all. And it worked. So John teaches us that God is timeless, but God also communicates with us in our everyday lives. We may not always recognize it, but we should be open to accepting advice that is grounded in love and truth. And if we're willing to accept and act on advice like that, our lives can change dramatically for the better.